Welcome to Metal Lake Alliance Church. And it, it really is church. If church is saying something to God and hearing something from God, then we can do that together in this next little while. However, church is usually more than that, isn't it? And some of that's a little more difficult. In the book of Hebrews, we read this. And let, not, let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So how do we meet? Well, right now, this is the best we've got in terms of meeting. But we can meet each other in other ways, individually, and in small groups. We can meet online, we can meet on the telephone, we can meet by emails back and forth. And so we can do this thing of encouraging one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. You don't know. Nobody knows. But I know it's closer than it was for these people. And so we can encourage each other. So welcome to church. And I trust that this will be a blessed time for you.
of that encouraging each other we're going to pray this morning but how about while we pray while I express prayer that you make sure you pray for at least one other person that you know is part of this community part of uh, people that are watching this or sometimes watch this but you're not with them right now so would you express their name to God this morning and ask God's blessing and grace to be on them Let's pray. Father, thanks for this day. Thank you for your presence and your care. Thank you for your understanding of this whole situation and your power to care for us and to care for the affairs of this country and this world. Father, we trust you with our lives. We trust you with our health. We trust you with our finances. We trust you with our jobs. We trust you with our social relationships. We trust you with this whole virus thing and know that you will do what is best for us and for our world. So we give ourselves to you, Father. And as, as we do that, we pray for other people, people that we're sitting with right now or people that are far away. And I ask, Father, that you touch them and care for them and bless their lives and draw them very close to you. Meet their needs in Jesus' name. Amen.
I love scrambled eggs. Mm. These eggs don't taste very good. In fact, they hardly taste anything at all. I must have forgot something. Mm. Oh, I forgot the salt. Salt makes everything taste better. Mm. Perfect. Well, did you know that when Jesus was on earth, and for a very long time, actually, people didn't have fridges, and they had to keep food from spoiling or from going rotten by using salt. So salt was very important to people. But Jesus said something strange one day to his followers. He said, you are salt, 
to everyone on earth. That's weird. You don't look like salt to me. We would never fit in a salt shaker. But I wonder what that meant. We are salt to everyone on earth. Well, I'm going to get my friends here, Joey and Susie, to help us understand what it means to be salt. Hi, Joey. Hi there. Hi, Susie. Hi. Well, can you show us how we can use our salt? Jesus said we had salt in us. Okay. Hey, Susie, you've got my truck. No, it's not yours. Yes, it is. No, I found it in the hallway. Well, it came out of my room and it's mine. And I want it back and... Oh, just a minute. You know what? I've got an idea, Susie. How about I let you use my truck for 10 minutes? And then I could use it after. Yeah, would you do that? That's so kind. You're going to share with me? Yeah, I think I will. Well, what a great idea. Joey figured out how to use the salt that's in him. He decided to share with his sister. Let's see if we can think of another way to use our salt. Hmm. Oh, I've got an idea. Joey, Joey, look, I cut my finger. Leave me alone. But look, it's bleeding and it hurts. Can't you help me? No, I'm busy. Go away. <laughs> oh. Uh-oh. Hey, listen, Susie, I'm sorry. I'll run in the house and get a Band-Aid for you, and then we'll go and find Mum together, okay? <laughs> Thanks, Joey. You're so kind. Yeah. That's another way to use the salt that's in you. What a great idea, being kind to each other. Well, what about this one? Hey, Joey, Susie, time to clean up your toys. Have a bath and get in bed. No, I don't want to. Me either. We're having fun, Mom. Yeah, I'm staying up till 10. I'm going to stay up till midnight. I'm going to watch a movie. We're not being very nice. That's right. We should try using our salt and listening to Mom. Hey, let's surprise her. Let's clean up here and have a bath and get in bed real quick. Hey, Mom, we're in bed. Want to come and pray for us? Okay, so we learned a lot from Joey and Susie today that, you know, when you're home and things are going a little stinky and people aren't being very nice to one another, we can always stop and think and decide to use some of that salt, some of that goodness that God put in us, right? Bye. Oh
Have you ever tried to fix something yourself and it just goes <laughs> Yeah, I've done that too. Actually, the camera that you're watching me with right now uh, failed miserably some time ago. And it did have a problem, and I didn't cause it. There was a little piece of plastic that broke off on the inside. But in my trying to fix it, I actually made the problem worse. So with the warranty expired, I finally decided, you know what, I need to take this to an expert. And so I took it to my wife. And you know, she dealt with it a lot different than I would have. She took the camera and she looked inside like I had done. And then she said, you know what, we got to take this thing apart. I was like, no, we've never taken apart one of these DSLR cameras. It's just, it's so intricate and I don't want to wreck it, but it wasn't working. I didn't have any other options. So I placed it in her hands and she opened it up. And she took out all these little pieces, little tiny screws and wires and cables and all these things were in, in, interconnected. Then she found the problem in the midst of it. And it was just these little tiny, tiny wires that got bent. It was such a little thing. And yet the whole thing fell apart. And you know, if I had taken it to her right away, then I think I could have avoided a lot of the brokenness and the frustration of trying to put this thing back together. I had to take it to someone who knew that they were doing. They had to know how it worked and how it was put together. And you know, our hearts are the same way with God, aren't they? We're complex people. We look at the world that we live in and the way that we interact with our environment, we realize, wow, we are created beautifully and intricately. And so it's no wonder then that when we don't abide by the instructions, when we uh, try to fix things ourselves, when we realize that there's something wrong, something broken, that we see everything unravel, it just becomes worse. If you've been looking at the news this last week, if, if I know when I looked at it, I got very upset. I was discouraged. I was it was like I was under a shadow. And I didn't know how to deal with this weight and the gloom that came with it. We perpetuate violence. When we want to deal with someone else who's hurt us, we seem to hurt them back so naturally. That was always the way that we responded when things went wrong. Remember in, in the Garden of Eden that we've talked about a few times? When Adam and Eve were confronted about it, right away they started to blame one another. But, but it was blame shifting. And we see that today. We see the blame shifting that goes on. This is nothing new. This is something that we've always dealt with. We need a different way. We need a different perspective in order to, to deal with all of these frustrations. The other day I had an opportunity to watch my son playing on a swing set. He was out in this yard and, and I took a picture of him. And he wanted me specifically to take a picture of when he was hanging upside down. And I remember thinking, you remember what that was like as a kid? Where your perspective was so different? You could hang upside down on these swing sets and you'd look up and you could see the, the clouds in the sky and it was like your feet were planted there. And you'd reach down and touch the grass. It was, a, it was so much fun to be able to see things from a different point of view. And that is what the Jesus prayer is about. When we connect with God and we, we enter into that relationship with Him, He changes our point of view and our perspective. He wants to bring a real transformation in our life and our situation. And so when we think about the world and some of the, the foundations that it has built for itself, we see that it wants to determine what's good in its own design. We see that it wants to determine what, it's, uh, what it can do, the possibilities that are available, and it wants to determine its own value. It assigns different worths to things differently than God's perspective. This last week I've had an opportunity to, to do some more reading about Eric Little. If you've ever seen the, uh, the Chariots of Fire movie, that's Eric Little. He was uh, an incredible runner and he was an incredible man of faith. 
And one of the things that he said was that either God is our guide or else we are guided by something or someone else. That's what we see in our world. So how do we change it? How do we change um, this downward spiral that we see in the world? It starts here. It starts with me. And it starts with you. It starts with our hearts before the Lord. Because He created us. And if there's something broken, we need to take it back to the manufacturer. We're on the last bit of the Jesus Prayer segment today. And it's, For thine is the kingdom, or for yours is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Seems pretty simple, doesn't it? Yet it deals with those foundational lies that our world is based upon. When we say, your kingdom come, well, what are we saying? We're saying that God, His rule is our standard. What He says is good is good. What He says is evil is evil. And that doesn't mix. Either it is what God wants, or something or someone else wants to take us off that path. That's what we talked about last week when we talked about the trials of temptation. Because there are going to be things in your life that you know are going to be wrong, and they pull us off, right? That's, that's the one side, the forbidden desires bit. Things that draw us off that path that God has, that we know are wrong. But there's also times where we might have a couple of options. You know, this, this might be really good, but maybe we know God wants us to do this. And so what do we do when we have that kind of a choice? Well, even if they're both good things from our point of view, if we pick the one that we know that God doesn't want us to do, that's a bad choice. Because he's the one who determines what is good. Think about how that works in a, in a, in a country. If a government establishes some kind of a law, say, don't go over 100 kilometers an hour, and we go, well, you know, the king's not around, the cops aren't around, I can, just, I can just take off. Well, it's still breaking a rule, right? We might not get caught right then and there, but if, if, if a cop pulled out, uh, yeah, you'd be in trouble. That's, that's how that works. But God sees everything. The things that happen at night, the things that happen in secret, God knows it all. Think about even the things in your own life that you uh, do that we know are wrong. Whether, you know, some of us deal with drunkenness. Some of us deal with sexual sin. Some of us deal with pride and power. Some of us deal with the love of money. These are really specific things that we know are wrong. And so what do we do when there's, there's that temptation? Well, we have to go to God. We have to trust in Him. And God says that He will give us the strength to endure it. This world is His, and so we function by His rule. The second part, that second lie, this idea that, that I determine my own possibilities, that's why uh, the world is such a rat race, why people are always trying to get a one-up on each other, trying to get ahead in their careers, trying to get ahead in um, all of the things that they can accomplish. But you know what? God wants to accomplish something greater, something more. We all know that we have certain abilities, things that God has enabled us to be able to do. And I think, you know what, the world wants to put us into a little compartment, in a little box, and say, well, see, you are this, not this. You are that, not that. You are a singer, not a plumber. Or you are a carpenter, not a painter. And I think we limit God when we do that. Because God looks at all these different distinctions of things there, and he goes, no, don't you know who I made you to be? He enters into our situations and changes the very fabric of who we are to become more like him in a way that this world doesn't understand. Think about some of the people who, who have impacted history. A lot of them ended up in places where it was like, why in the world are they even here? This world may look at what you are capable of and say, you will only ever amount to this. 
This is your potential. We are only limited, the truth is, we are only limited in our potential by our trust in God and what he has designed for us to do. This is something that C.S. Lewis said. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought the most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. I think a lot of us are afraid of stepping out and trying things because we're afraid to do it wrong and because it's rather scary. But if God calls us to do something, if he calls us to trust him in our situation, then there needs to be a bit of that handing off. There needs to be a saying, okay, God, I'm going to trust you with this. I don't know what you're going to do with it, but I'm going to trust you in it. The Bible has this really cool imagery in it that we are like clay and God molds it as he wants. And as he molds it, he fashions it into exactly um, the instrument of purpose that he has in mind. It makes sense then that when we have an idea of what our abilities are, what we're capable of, um, we end up with a different perspective than his. My wife has been buying plants and putting them around our house right now. And it made me think of this story about a gardener who would carry his buckets across uh, to this garden every day. And the one bucket had holes in it. And the bucket just felt awful. Because as the gardener would take these buckets down to the end of the sidewalk all the time, by the time we got there, that one bucket had gone empty. <laughs> so frustrated, you know, the bucket eventually complained to the gardener, why in the world won't you just fix this? Why won't you fix the brokenness in me? Because I can't get to the end. I can't get to the end without having something to give. But the gardener's perspective is different. The gardener turned and showed, and where the water leaked out, things were growing. Things were changing. And God wants to do that in you. He takes the things that are broken and he crafts them and he changes them into something that brings him glory and brings him honor. When we talk about that his is the kingdom, we say, God, your way is better. When we say that yours is the power, we're saying that you have the ability to accomplish more with my life than I can on my own. You know how to deal with it better than I can. And finally, when we say that yours is the glory, what we're saying is that everything, everything in this world, everything in my life is meant to bring honor to him who created it all, who put it there in the first place. He made it good. And where things are broken, he wants to mend it. He wants to, to fix it. And when, when it's a good job being fixed, when, when the accomplishment out of it is something that is desirable and beautiful, we bring it before God and say, wow, I can't believe you did this. This is amazing. That's what prayer is about. It's that changing of our perspective, coming to him honestly and openly and saying, I don't know how to fix this. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to mend this. But God, I know you love. I know you care. So here it is. The Jesus prayer reminds us that God is our Father. That he loves you unconditionally. That he wants to guide us away from the things that want to cause us destruction. God is the one who wants to walk us through every moment of our life. And he wants to show us that he provides. We might have strength. God might give you incredible abilities to build wealth for yourself, to, to play music, to build things. It could be incredible giftings. And he wants you to use it for his glory, for his kingdom. That's when it'll feel right. That's when we'll be like, oh, that's why I was designed that way. The very last bit of the Jesus prayer's conclusion reminds us that God is God forever.
and that means all time. For yours is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. He was God back yesterday, and God is God today. God is God tomorrow. That's what it means by forever. For every age, He is God, and these things still hold true. We're going to see kingdoms, we're going to see nations that rise and fall all over history, but God still reigns. There was a man I worked with for a while when I used to be in PA at Radio Shack. I remember him coming to me one day and confessing that he was rather frustrated when he found out that I was a Christian, that I believed in God. And the reason was, when he was younger, his younger, younger brother had gotten hit by a van. It was a church van, and his uh, brother was killed. And from that moment, he put up all these walls. He said, I don't want anything to do with God, because who in their right mind would allow this to happen? This last week, I heard uh, about a lead singer of a, a famous Christian band, and he walked away from the faith. He said, I, I don't believe in God anymore. Because what kind of God, what kind of good God allows such suffering? And I know the one side of the answer is, well, we, it's because of free will. God has allowed us to have free will. But even if that was the case, I can see people's frustration. If this life is all there is, that we're born and then we die, and that's it, then God is tremendously unjust. But this isn't, this isn't the end. That is the importance when we talk about Jesus' death and resurrection. Death is not the end. As we trust in Christ, God has a life beyond this. And when we look back, we go, oh, I did not see it from that point of view. What we see in the Bible is not a God who is absent from our suffering. We see a God who steps into our suffering, who knows exactly what we've gone through. He knows what we're feeling. He knows what we're struggling with. That is the importance of prayer. And when we recognize that God loves us completely, we know that we can place whatever is valuable, whatever we find precious into his hands. And we say, okay, God, okay, I'll trust you. I'll trust you with it, knowing that you are good and you can do more with it than I can. We often end with a benediction that's a bit like that. To him who can do more than we ever ask or imagine. <laughs> to him who is able, we give it to him. And that is the last little bit of the Jesus prayer. Amen. Let it be is what it means. Just let it, let it be so. It's committing. It's taking all of the things that we've said before the Lord that I want your rule in my life. I want you to change me. I know that you provide. I know that you forgive and I will forgive others. And it's recognizing that everything in this world, everything in my heart and my life, it's his. And in light of that, I say, okay, here you are. And we bring it to him honestly, completely, and put it into his hands. If my wife was working on that camera and I kept getting in there, I'm like, no, no, you got to do it this way. Oh, it would be such a mess. We have to trust the manufacturer of our life, especially with the brokenness, especially with those little things. It makes all the difference. My hope and my prayer for you in these days to come is that you will continue in your daily life to spend time with the Lord who loves you, May God transform your life. May he be able to do with it more than we can ever ask or imagine. May he take the, your viewpoint and may he change it and transform it into something that lets you see that heaven is meant to be our foundation. And when heaven is our foundation, then we can reach out and we can touch the world with the love of Jesus like we never thought possible. May I pray for you. Heavenly Father, I am so grateful for your love, and I am so grateful for the way that you work within our situations. That you don't work in spite of our brokenness, but you work in the midst of our brokenness. God, would you bring about a new appreciation 
for the good things that you provide for our life? Would we see that you are the God who loves and cares for his children? And may in turn, God, may we trust you with everything of our life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And may we put it all into your hands, knowing that you can do with it more than we could ever see with our own eyes. Thank you, God, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
As we conclude this uh, time together, would you let me leave you with this benediction? May the God who cares, and the God who loves you to come to him and pray to him and tell him all the things you're thinking, may he comfort you this week in the knowledge that he does hear and he does act for your best. And may he give you a new awareness of his presence. May you know that he's walking beside you, watching over you. Amen? Amen.